You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome. My name is Frank Ambrosio. I'm the co-director of the My Dante Project at Georgetown University. It's my great pleasure today to welcome you to a reading of Inferno, the first canticle of Dante's Divine Comedy. It's voiced by Danny Fitzpatrick, and he's reading his own translation of the poem, which he recently completed in commemoration of the 700th anniversary of Dante's death in 1321. Poetry is meant to be spoken and heard. As Danny speaks, listen for the simplicity and economy of the English words and rhythms which Danny has discovered at work in Dante's native Italian. In their music and textures, we hear the primal power with which they break forth from silence, revealing the whole world, together with all of us, the living and the dead. So let's join Danny Fitzpatrick now on Dante's Journey. Hello and welcome back to the Dante in a Year podcast. Today, we're diving into Dante's Inferno, Canto 24. In that part of the youthful year that the sun tempers his strands below Aquarius, and the nights come even in the midst of day, when the frost on the earth assumes the image of her white sister, but softens a bit her hard pen, the rustic for whom food is lacking lifts himself and looks, and sees the plain all whitened, at which he slaps his hip, turns back into the house, and moans here, then there, as the fool that knows not what he should do. Then he goes again, and the hope is regained, seeing the world to have changed face in a bit of time, and he takes his staff and guides the little sheep out to pasture. So my master made me dismayed when I saw his brow so disturbed, and so quickly was the poultice put to the wound. For, as we came to the fallen bridge, the leader turned to me with that sweet countenance I'd seen first at the foot of the mountain. He opened his arms, after he'd taken counsel from studying the ruin, and took me up in his grip. And as he who strives and considers, who seems always to provide for what's ahead, so did he, lifting me to the very crown of a rock, look for another ledge, saying, Now grasp that above but test first that it will bear you. It was no way for those dressed in the cloaks, for only with pain, though he was light and I was lifted, could we mount up crag to crag. And if it were not that in that precinct the slope was shorter than in the other, I don't know about him, but I'd have been overcome. But because Malabolge all hangs toward the portal of the basest pit, the side of every valley is built so that one coast surges and the other descends. We came in the end to just that point where the utmost rock had crumbled. The pace had so milked my lungs when I'd reached the top that I could go on no more, but rather seated myself at the first chance. Now it comes that you must strip yourself, said the master, for, sitting on plumes or under covers, none come to fame, without which one consumes his life, and leaves such vestige of himself on earth as a fume in the air and the foam on the water. And so rise, conquer this weariness with the spirit that wins each battle, if not drawn down by the grave body. There looms a longer stair you must ascend, Don't stop at having parted from there. If you understand me, now let it avail you. So I arose, showing myself more filled with breath than I felt within me, and I said, Go, for I am strong and ardent. We took the way up the ridge, which is rocky, constricted, and difficult, and steeper than that before. I went on speaking so as not to seem weak, at which a voice issued from the next depth, a voice ill fit to form words. I don't know what it said, though I was over the back of the arch that cuts across. But he who spoke appeared to be moving. I gazed below, but living eyes can't enter that depth for the darkness. So I, Master, go on to that other ring and let us dismount from this wall. 
For as from here I hear and don't understand, so below I see and make nothing out. I render no other response, he said, than to do it, for the honest question ought to lead to silent work. We descended the bridge from the height where it joins with the eighth bank, and then was the ditch made manifest to me. And I saw within a terrible nest of serpents, and of such unusual sort that the memory still chills the blood. Let Libya with her sands vaunt herself no more, for if she produces Chelidri, Jaculi, Farea, and Kenkres with Amphisbina, no such pestilence or horror has she ever shown with all Ethiopia or that which lies upon the Red Sea. Within this cruel, distressing abundance rushed people nude and terrified, without hope of a hole or heliotrope. Their hands were bound behind with serpents, these fixed head and tail through the legs and then gripped each other in front. And behold, there was one by our ridge, and a serpent rushed up and transfixed him there where the neck and the shoulders are knotted. Never was O or I so swiftly written as he caught flame and burned, and came to be all cinder as he fell. And then, distraught upon the earth, the ashen powder gathered itself on its own and returned the same once more. So, as the great sages profess, that the phoenix dies and then is born again when it nears the five hundredth year. In its life it neither feeds on herb nor blade of grass, but only on the tears of incense and cardamom, and nard and myrrh bind at last. And as is he who falls and know not how, by force of a demon that drags him to earth, or by another oppression that binds man, when he rises, wanders all about, all marred by the grand anguish he has suffered, and looking, sighs. So was the sinner once risen. Oh, the power of God, how severe it is, that crushes such faults in its vengeance. The leader then asked him who he was, to which he replied, I reigned from Tuscany a brief time back in this fierce gullet. The bestial life pleased me, not the human, such a mule I was. I am Vani Fucci the beast, and Pistoia was my worthy den. And I to the leader, tell him not to move, and ask what fault has pinned him here below, for I saw him a man of blood and of rages. And the sinner who listened did not deny it, but directed against me his soul and face, which was painted with sad shame. Then he said, for you to have caught me as you see me in this misery more saddens me than when I was taken from the other life. I am unable to deny you that you ask. I am sent here far, far below for my thieving of the sacristy's lovely array, while another was falsely accused. But so that you not enjoy such a sight, if ever you are out of these dark lands, open your ears to my annunciation and hear. Pistoia first divests herself of blacks, then Florence renews her people and her ways. Mars drags vapor from Mal Val di Magra, which is enshrouded by turbid clouds, and with a bitter, impetuous tempest over Campo Pisano will all come to combat. There the sudden bolt will rip apart the cloud, so that every white will be wounded. And I've said this that you might sorrow. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Dante in a Year podcast. See you next time for Dante's Inferno, Canto 25. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you.
Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.